Welcome to the StoryCraft Cafe. Come in, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and get ready to join the storytelling conversation. StoryCraft Cafe is brought to you by Dabble, the ultimate cloud-based fiction writing software. Here we're going to bring together storytellers from all walks to encourage and empower you to craft your best story. Hello everyone, my name is Grace and I am the cafe manager over here at the StoryCraft Cafe. I'm here to personally invite you to come check out the StoryCraft Cafe if you haven't already been by. There is so much happening in the cafe this month. We are running live events with authors, doing group writing sprints, and talking a lot about the ins and outs of writing, and the joys and the woes. If this sounds like fun, stop by for a cozy digital beverage at storycraft.cafe. That's S-T-O-R-Y-C-R-A-F-T dot C-A-F-E. I can't wait to see you all there. Thanks for joining us today in the StoryCraft Cafe. We have an amazing interview for you with Dervla McTiernan. But before we hear from Dervla, let's rewind a bit and hear from Terry Brooks, talking about how the inspiration for his long-running fantasy series, Shannara, is inspired by something that you might be surprised at, and not the inspiration that most people assume. Well, I think that uh, one of the sage pieces of advice I got from my first editor was, quit trying to reinvent the wheel, Brooks. You know, there are no new stories. You know, don't try to create something that hasn't been written before because it's all been written before. What makes a good story is the telling of the story, the way you tell it, your voice, your approach to it. And I think I was trying to emulate some of what Faulkner had done uh, with his his uh, books about Yachnip Top County, uh, but um, I didn't want to re rehash that same type of story. So I put it in a fantasy world. And so it was the, tr the topics that were interesting to me uh, that I was focusing on, which had to do with the way secrets and families destroy the family or the members of the family. Um, I liked the concept of the uh, trailer trash Snopes and the landed gentry of the Compsons. And the Snopes, of course, who have no moral core at all, uh, have an advantage over the the Compsons who do, but who hide much of what they've done that's not good. And so as a result, the Snopes have a, a, a crowbar with which to tear them down. And, and I liked that. And I wanted to I wanted to do something with that because I thought, you know, and, and the final thing was, is that the, the way power works and, uh, f you know, which of which there are examples everywhere we turn, that power corrupts. It always does in some fashion or another. And the more stronger the power, the stronger the responsibility for wielding it, and the more you have to be aware of the fact that it can bring you down pretty fast if you misuse it, um, or if you let it seduce you. Um, so all those all those types of things and a bunch of others all entered into uh, what I wanted to do, and a lot of that was in Faulkner's work. And I, I I can't even tell you why I was so entranced with those books. But when I, I began re reading them, I, I don't know. I thought I'd read The Bear first because uh, it was a you know a shorter. Um, piece of work right um, but i think when, when i went on to read the entire snopes trilogy and you know and and all the rest that he had done uh then um i, I just i was you know reading them as fast as i could because they were so compelling to me and i, I don't you know i and i can't even tell you why i just the way he wrote uh the way he told the story it wasn't particularly fast paced but it was insightful and it was compelling and it made me think and all those things you know, I think uh, seduced me in the end uh, into absolutely loving his work. Today, I am super excited to have Dervla McTiernan on the show with me. Uh, she has an amazing new book. It's called The Murder Rule. And I was just telling her before we started recording that I've been listening to the audio book of this. And it, it's one of those that just captivates you. We, we've had a lot going on this weekend and, and I've had it. Uh, in my earbuds and and I catch myself just, uh, you know, in another world. And that's exactly what you want to happen uh, when you read a book. And so I love it. And I know we're going to have a fantastic conversation. Welcome to the show, Dervla. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Hank. I'm really happy to be here. 
I'm, I'm excited to have you. Um, Derbly, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, gosh, you know, honestly, that's a bit of a tricky one for me because I never really thought about, I mean, look, I've loved books since I was tiny. I think one of my earliest memories is learning to read, you know, genuinely um, following my mum around the house and my brothers and sisters around the house begging for someone to read me a story. And it's not that they were unfeeling. It's just that no one could possibly read me as many stories as I wanted to have read to me. And I remember my mum eventually saying to me, Derv, you know, you could do this yourself. Um, so I remember learning to read at her feet and, and she would, I knew my letters, so I'd call the letters out to her and she would give me the sound and that way I'd sound out the word. So from my earliest days I was reading, but, you know, I grew up at a time when Ireland was very practical and the idea of being a writer just seemed like something that was for other people. So it's not like I grew up wanting to be a writer because I just never thought that was an option for me. I mean, it was in our household, it was very much like you, you grow up, you get an education, you get a job, you can pay your bills and writing would have been sort of considered, you know, unrealistic or a bit of a dreamer's thing. So I really came to it very late. So it, it was a very practical um you know um time where you you get something sensible where you can provide for yourself and your family and um you know the the dreaming is you know for dreamers and uh, oh, yeah, yeah. My, when my parents were growing up you know ireland was a, was not a very wealthy country there just wasn't a whole lot i mean people would right. know that in the states we've had generations of emigration from ireland and um so my parents would have had to work very hard to kind of establish themselves and they understood how tough that could be and they wanted the best for us. And so it wasn't because they weren't trying to deny me anything, but they just would never have, you know, supported that. And right. they wanted me to be safe and secure. So writing was not safe and secure. <laughs> <laughs> um, what uh, was was there ever a book or uh, a, a uh, an author or a series maybe um, that that gave you that first uh, kind of feeling that books could transport you to somewhere else? It's funny because the books I remember most from my early childhood that I fell in love with were the Inna Blyton books, you know, and I really just loved them. And I loved the, you know, the Mallory Towers stories and all these stories of wealthy English public school girls, which is about as far from real, my life as it's possible to be. But it's I have a strange feeling about those now because I, I listened to a podcast recently in the UK where a woman was speaking about her experience of in a blight and growing up. And, and she was she's a black woman. And this, you know, those books are very racist. And the experience she had in the schoolroom when those books are being read to her. And I listened to her talk about her experience and it was heartbreaking so now i look back at those books and i'll never feel the same way about them again you know yeah yeah um so you um you spent about a dozen years at, as a lawyer is that right yes i was a lawyer in ireland for a long time um, so, i set up a little practice in the west of ireland when i was 26. nice what what was it that um initially drew you to the law well in a funny sort of way, I think it was stories because my subject that I loved in school was history. And the way history was examined for your final exam in school in Ireland was we, we wrote very long essays um, about different subjects in history. And so really it was a sort of storytelling. And the, sto the thinking at the time was if you were good at history, you'd be good at law because you had to study a lot of case law, a lot of constitutional laws, a lot of reading and fact based stuff. And so I think it was a combination of the fact that I loved history and I'd watched a bit too much Ali McBeal or L.A. Law or something <laughs> like that. And so I thought, oh, this sounds like fun. Of course, you know, the reality was very different. What uh, what type of law did you practice? What was your specialty? I practiced commercial law. So I, I wrote and I negotiated huge contracts. I mean, 400, 600 page contracts. And because Ireland's a small country, you know, most of our trading partners are American or, you know, main, mainland Europe. So we would have done a lot of negotiating with lawyers in France or Germany or Sweden or the US. So that was my job. So I've, I've known uh, quite a few writers who began 
uh, their career as lawyers. That there, there definitely seems to be a pathway from practicing law to to writing fiction. Um, and you know, you can you can uh, make whatever jokes about that connection that you want to. <laughs> um, but I always thought that it, that uh, that law was a a natural gateway um, because whether you are uh, arguing a case in court. Uh, or you are writing briefs and uh, you know this sort of thing. It it's all storytelling at the at the core of it. You, you're trying to uh, communicate something that that hopefully will sway um, the person who is determining your case in your favor. That 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 is storytelling at its core, isn't it? I completely agree with you. I think I think. We, we underestimate the power of narrative. I think yes. we're beginning to understand it a bit more now, but I think in a court, if you're arguing a criminal case, it's all about the narrative. I sat in on a criminal case in, in the UK once in London, which was a murder trial, and it was so clear that, that both sides were trying to create a story so that people would understand more the point of view of the various parties. And I think it comes back to the fact that, you know, I always think of fiction as this, it's a huge exercise of empathy, isn't it? You know, we read a story, we're in the shoes of another person for as long as we're in that story in a way that's kind of hard to do outside of narrative. So I think that that's what we're doing in, in, in the court, trying to, to create the narrative so that people can exercise their empathy muscle. Sure, sure. Um, somewhere along the way, uh, you immigrated from Ireland to Australia. Um, what, that, you know, that's literally halfway around the world um <laughs> what uh, you know what brought that on that that huge kind of life upheaval yeah it was a huge change i'll tell you it was so i started the practice when i was 26 and i was very young but i thought it was a good idea at the time and i worked very hard and, and it was very successful for a while but I did a lot of property work as well as the commercial law. And Ireland was going through a property boom, which kind of turned into a bubble. And then obviously the subprime crisis hit in the US and the knock on effect in, in Ireland was pretty intense. So the Irish economy all but collapsed, really. And um, most of my clients lost everything, some of them down to family homes. Mm. So, you know, we were really in a tough situation. They were in a position where they needed probably more legal work than ever, but couldn't afford to pay their bills. And which, of course, made it pretty difficult for me to pay my bills. And, yes. you know, the, the hours got longer, the work got harder and the income kind of disappeared to nothing. And we tried to keep going for as long as we could. We did it for a few years, but eventually it just got too hard, just just emotionally as well as financially. And by the end of it, I just never wanted to practice law again, Hank. I mean, I'd been struggling a bit. <laughs> before it all went horribly wrong. But by the end of this, I was just done. So um, my husband is a civil engineer. We said we wanted a fresh start. We decided it, will, it was either going to be Australia or Canada because both were offering visas for engineers at the time. But I think Canada was only 12 months and we had a two year old a baby on the way. I said, no, 12 months too short for what we want to do. So we decided on Australia and we ended up in Perth, which is talked about as the most remote city in the world. I think factually it's not quite. There might be one that pips it, but it's pretty close. Wow. And and somewhere along the way, uh, after moving to Australia, um, the the writer bug bit uh, or, or maybe bit again. Um, what was uh, what was it that that woke up the writer gene in you? Well, you know, I think it was maybe because of our upbringing, you know, both me and my husband, we'd both been, you know, really responsible. And I kind of put that in caps and underlined, you know, it's like you do everything right. You take all the boxes, you take the responsible job, et cetera, et cetera. Whether or not it makes you happy, that's just what you do. Right. And we did all that in Ireland and it just didn't work. You know, everything that could go wrong went wrong. So we were on the plane on our way to the to Australia. I mean, we were we were flat broke at that stage. Hank. We really had nothing left at that point. And we kind of put our heads together and we said, you know what? We tried to do it that way and it went horribly wrong. And now let's just let's just do it exactly the way we want to do it. Like, let's just live our lives exactly as we want. And maybe we've got as much chance of that working out as the other way. Right. Um, so our little boy was born five weeks after we landed in Perth. So that took and then he didn't sleep for two years. So it took me a little bit of time. But around 2014, um, I was working during the day. 
be with kids in the afternoon and I started writing at night and I just said that's it this is you know I've just books are my life to be a writer would be you know just beyond a dream I'm going to give this five years the way I would any career change you know I'm going to work take this really seriously I'm going to write every night except Thursday which was open the bottle of wine night don't mess with that <laughs> but otherwise I worked every night and I just said I'm going to give it five years and I said to myself if at the end of the five years there's nothing like nothing has happened there's been not even the smallest suggestion that I could be published in the future well maybe I'll reassess at that stage but it's funny because I look back at it and I think even then I wasn't willing to say well I'll give it up like I was like oh I'll reassess if I've given it five years and failed I'll reassess you know I, I knew I wanted to do it. I mean, I, as soon as I started writing, I knew I would never stop publication or not. I, you, yeah, that's so funny because um, I, I had a, a conversation with Brandon Sanderson uh, a while back, the the uh, the fantasy author. Oh, yeah. I know and, he's amazing. Uh, yeah. And he's made a lot of, you know, waves lately with the uh, with this big Kickstarter that he did. But but regardless, we, we were talking about kind of his writing pre-publication. And he wrote something like 13 books before wow. getting published. And, and, you know, I asked him if that ever, um, you know, if he was ever discouraged. And he said, he said, this is what, what people get so twisted um, about um, you know, when you do something for the love of it. He said, you know, if I would have never gotten published, then, you know, my kids would have just inherited a house one day that just had manuscripts stuffed into every closet <laughs> and corner. You know, I was yeah. going to continue writing whether anyone bought those books or not, you know, and, you know, they ultimately did. And, you know, it turned out OK for him. But, you know, um, you know, the, the fact that when you find that thing that you love and you're going to do it regardless, what a freeing feeling. Oh, I love that he said that. I just love it. And it's so true. I mean, I the happiest one of the happiest moments of my life was a couple of months after I started um, writing. I went to a writer's festival two hours south of where we lived. And I was I met a friend, someone who was a published writer actually at the time and still is. And we became great friends, still great friends today. I was hanging out with readers. My husband came to meet me the next night. And I distinctly remember crossing the street with him. And I was like, incandescent I was so happy you know and I just said to him you know what I don't care if I'm never published it doesn't matter because if I can have this if I can write every day and I can come away every now and again and be with like other readers and be with book people like I don't need any more than this this is this is just it this is amazing and it's still true like the writing the writing is the best bit like the publication is fantastic and some really exciting amazing things have happened to me along the way but the writing is the best bit and no one can give that to you and no one can take it away from you. I love that. Um, in, in the beginning, you were very fortunate to, uh, to make a friend, if we can uh, call it that in Cormac Riley. Uh, <laughs> tell me about Cormac and, and where did he come from? And uh, you, you published three books with, with him as the, the protagonist uh, of those, but what a great character. Oh, thanks, Hank. I'm glad you like him. I Cormac kind of was born out of a bit of frustration that I had. I was reading, you know, I read a lot of crime fiction and I was reading, I guess I was happened to read a few books in a row that featured a similar character. And I remember particularly reading um, an Ian Rankin book and his main character, Rebus, you know, was an older man. And like, I think Ian would completely agree with this, like quite a curmudgeon. And uh, he was having a, you know, a mental whinge to himself, Rebus in the book. And he was bemoaning the fact that he had a terrible relationship with his daughter and that they hadn't been in touch and that you know he was they were so far apart and all I was thinking as I read the book was well you could call her you know, it wouldn't be that hard <laughs> just pick up the phone and it was frustrating me because there are so many of these male characters who were just like emotionally illiterate and no relationship like a, a, a long trail of broken relationships behind them they'd you know further away from their children than ever etc and that just didn't marry with my experience because the men I know are just not like that you know they're perfectly capable of picking up the phone if they have to and they're just as involved in looking after their kids and you know I, I just didn't recognize that so I wanted to and you know also I think it's easy to be the hero if you never have to do the school pickup 
No, right. <laughs> never <Right>. have to <laughs> return a phone call if, you, if you're just allowed to be like, you know, I, I don't know, a school kid. So I wanted to write somebody that I could genuinely like and admire. And I wanted him to be real, like not perfect, you know, because that would be horribly painful, but yeah. just real and like flawed he'll mess up along the way but he's perfectly capable of maintaining a relationship you know yeah um so when you were writing that first book was uh did that ultimately become the ruin yeah and it's i set out actually to write the ruin like when i started writing that book i just had one picture in my mind which was of these two kids maud and jack and maud was about 15 and jack you know was very young in the in the in the idea I had maybe six or seven and they were sitting in this crumbling country house in the Irish countryside in one of these old hunting lodge type houses sitting on the stairs holding hands and like it's dark the electricity's out it's getting dark outside the wallpaper's peeling off the walls it's damp and they're scared and all I knew going in was that Maud had looked after Jack since the moment he was born and cared for him and protected him but didn't know if she could protect him from what was coming. That's all I had. I didn't know what got them there or where they were going. I had to write the book to find out. And Cormac just sort of grew from that because I needed I needed a policeman or woman to to come to them that in that little early scene. And I needed I wanted it to be someone who was really like a very good person, but uncomfortable, not very experienced with young children. So I decided to make him a young male cop who'd be less likely to have done a lot of babysitting in his time. And so that kind of Cormac's just sort of grew out of that scene, really. So you wrote Cormac for three books, um, Mm -hmm. I believe. You had a trilogy of books with him, uh, then wrote The Sisters, and now your new book is The Murder Rule. Um, After having written um a a a trilogy of books uh you know with having a a series character who um you know when when people pick up the second and third books of that series there's a bit of world building that's already been done um mm-hmm. there's already some character development that's that's been laid out um and it's very easy to for readers to get into you know books 2 and 3 of a series because you've already done the work in in the first book of of you know, getting things laid out. Sure. Um, so compare and contrast writing a series with a series character or, you know, a, a kind of a band of characters uh, versus writing standalones, which your your uh, last two books have been with the sisters and the murder rule. Um, the murder rule um, is, is, is so fresh on my mind because I, I literally just finished it. Um, and and uh, it's so dynamic um, and and you know that's it, there. There's kind of a different bit of store uh, of world building and storytelling that goes into writing a brand new story with brand new characters in a brand new world. Um, as the writer, can you talk a little bit about the difference in writing a series versus standalones? Sure. I mean, I think it's funny because when I wrote the Ruin, I didn't actually have in my mind that it was going to be a series book. I wrote it as you know, this is the story. It was only later that it kind of grew into a series and I was very happy to write it as a series and it always felt like a trilogy to me. And I don't know if that's because I read fantasy for most of my teens and 20s, but, you know, so many books that are fantasy um, series at that stage were trilogies. It just felt like it would have a natural arc to that. Um, yeah. And it was challenging as the books went along because honestly, I think, you know, you forget more as a writer or at least I do, like I've, I've, you know, I might've written 17 drafts by the time I get to the end of a book, but then I never want to open that cover again, 20 drafts (laughs) maybe, you know, so like time goes by and I've forgotten the names of minor characters and I'm not highly aware of lists made out of this is what such and such a person happened and they've got one sister, not two and all that sort of stuff. So you do have to kind of work a little bit on that one. Plus you're constrained because you are working within a world that already exists. There's something very freeing about coming to a standalone novel and you can go anywhere with it, but also you can try to achieve something within that novel that might be a bit more challenging if you're doing it over a series. Like when you're working a series, you've got a lot of other things that you're already holding in your hand as a writer. When you come to a standalone, you don't have to hold anything so you can try something new where you can play with a theme in a way that you might be a bit reluctant to do with 
a series, at least for me anyway. I think a series is trying to achieve something else. Whereas with the murder rule, I wanted it to be this like bam story. You know, I really wanted to just come at you and grab you. And then for you to be at the end of it going, whoa, what just happened? You know? <laughs> <laughs> at least that's what I was aiming for. So, so Dervla, where does your love of crime fiction come from? I don't know. It's a tricky one. I, I read, as I mentioned, I read fantasy most of my life. And then at some point in my 20s, I started bringing home crime novels. When I went to the bookshop more often than not, the books I came up home with were crime novels. I think part of it was there was just a stage where I was having trouble finding new fantasy writers that I could fall in love with. You know, I would just buy a new fantasy writer, wouldn't connect with me the same way. And I just kind of started looking for new things. I think I went to crime fiction because I found a lot of the same things there that I had found with fantasy, which was, first of all, there's a story. Like crime writers mostly know that they're there to entertain you. So you're going to have a good time. You know, that sounds a bit dark when we're talking about dark things, but it is intended to be entertainment for most writers. So that's important to me. And then there are always stakes um generally very often there are great characters it's it might be just a function of the fact that so many good writers are writing crime fiction maybe i would have I would have read anything and i do read more broadly but crime fiction just seems to have an extra something i think partly one of the other attractions apart from the quality of the writing and the storytelling is they tend to be cognizant of what's going on in our econ- you know in our society our economy there's, there tends to be a layer in there of something else to think about. You know, if I read Michael Connolly and I'm reading a book set in L.A., well, I'm getting a lot about the setting there, but maybe I'm also getting a little bit about homelessness or the context of how COVID is being dealt with in the U.S. Like those are just insights I wouldn't necessarily get elsewhere. So I really I really enjoy crime fiction for that, too. So I have to ask you this because um you brought up a, a fascinating topic. You you were or have been a fantasy lover for uh, all of your life. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a, a lot of times um, you'll you'll tell writers, you know, write the thing that you love the most. That's <laughs> that's where you're going to be successful as a writer. Um, but there came a, a time where you realized <laughs> that the thing that you wanted to love so badly um, maybe wasn't your ideal genre. Uh, is, 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 was there kind of an awakening like when it came to crime fiction versus fantasy? I, I, you know, I had a story that I carried around for quite a while that definitely was the beginning to a fantasy novel. And it, I tried it a couple of times and just never took off for me. But I didn't have the skills at that stage either. So, you know, maybe maybe I could write it now. I'm not sure. And I'm not saying I never would want to write something like that, although I think it would probably skew towards a younger audience if I did. I just think the story I had to tell, the the Maud and Jack story, was naturally a story that lent itself to crime fiction. And, you know, one of the writers I admire so much is Stephen King. And I always feel with, with him, he doesn't, he writes the books he writes. And then if people want to categorize them, they do that. But he writes the story he wants to write. And I just think that's amazing. And a lot of writers, I think, are pushed towards one to be consistent. Yeah. I under- totally understand why, because as a reader, you want to know what you're getting. And publishers understand that like readers come back because they're like, I read that before. I really enjoyed it. I'd like to read something similar. But my theory is and you'd have to ask him if this is true. I mean, one of the things I love about Stephen King is his creativity seems inexhaustible. Like he just constantly, like he's always coming out with something new and fresh and interesting. And I suspect that that creativity is fed at least in part because he doesn't feel constrained in any way. He just writes what he wants to write. And so right now I'm writing because that's what I really want to write. But I'd love to think that in the future, you know, it will go wherever my brain takes me. So I'm I'm glad you brought that up um, because yeah, I I totally agree with you that that you should write what you want to write and and of course there there are all sorts of factors that go into you know when you then want to publish that thing that you wrote mm-hmm. you know people need to know where to go in the bookstore to to find what they're looking for you know and, and I understand that that genres are important for for that side of the business and and all of that but 
you know, yeah, when Stephen King writes what he wants to write and, you know, ev- let everybody else figure out what to do with it when he's done. Yeah. I, I think he's probably earned that place to be able to do that now. Um, <laughs> and he's earned it. He's earned it. My God. <laughs> yes. Um, but when you're writing, do you think of the tropes and the the certain mechanics that work in a certain type of story? Like, like obviously, you know, when you're writing a book like The Murder Rule, did did you – did you kind of, you know, understand from the beginning, you know, these are the elements that I'm going to need to hit. These are the things that I'm going to, these are the brushes I'm going to paint with, if we use that metaphor, um, that are going to make this the type of story that that people that love crime fiction and thrillery kind of books are going to love. Do, do you think about those specific elements? I, I, I'm always thinking about the reader, but I don't think it's in exactly that way. I am. Um... The murder rule is a very particular kind of story. So it it follows a young woman called Hannah Rokeby. And Hannah is this young idealistic law student and she joins the Innocence Project when they're trying to fight this case to free a man, an innocent man from prison. And, you know, Hannah seems to be this girl who's trying to do everything to help and try to impress people and be part of the team. But she's actually doing the opposite. She's trying to destroy the case from the inside out. So. I had a lot of technical challenges in writing that story as from a writer from a writer's point of view because Hannah's pretty ruthless in the story, but I wanted to like her. I needed her to be <laughs> redeemable. I needed her to be, and I don't know how you feel about her, Hank, but I wanted by the end of the story to feel like I'd come to know her and understand her. But because I wanted her to be ruthless, but with a good heart, I needed to have her backstory. Like we needed to understand how a person like that is created. And I needed, wanted to do it in a way that really made it. And it's her mother's very. Two times and fall in love with one by the other. Just flick it through the pages to be really interested. And I was terrified that that was going to happen. And in fact, that was happening to me in the earlier drafts. My lower chapters were not working. So most of my writing mental energy really was going into making that work and getting those getting those chapters to do what they needed to do. And particularly in a story where there are a lot of, you know, twists and sort of I'm trying to misdirect you a little bit and then bring you back. That's where my head is at kind of working those levels and right. making sure that I the characters are there. So I'm not thinking about tropes so much, but I guess maybe I am ultimately because if I'm trying to work out how to make sure twists work, that's quite tropey. <laughs> so from the, I'm I'm so glad you brought that up about um, the uh, you know whether whether the reader likes Hannah or not because mm-hmm. you, you know you said that you wanted to like her even though you knew that there were going to be some some dark things going on uh, mm-hmm. with her and around her. Um, but, you know, almost from the beginning of the book, um, I knew there was something strange about this young woman. Um, <laughs> but there was, there's almost uh, a built-in empathy. Um, and I, I'm trying to really put that in words, but I don't, I don't really know how to convey that. But I, I knew that I should that there was something about this woman that I was going to want to root for. I just didn't know what it was yet. Um, I'm so it, d- does that, you know, like when you've written the first draft and then you're sitting there looking at it and, and you're like, you know, I don't know if this story works. What, what can I add here or there to, to really, you know, boost the reader's feelings, you know, at this point or, you know, well, first off, do you edit like that? Do you, do you finish a first draft and then start looking at, at ways that that you can manipulate, you know, the reader's emotions? Yeah, um, you do. Absolutely. It sounds awful. It but does, it but a it's a, absolutely what we do. It is what we do. It's 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 a deliberate process, right? I mean, you as a writer, we work so hard behind the scenes so that the reader doesn't have to so we are absolutely trying to evoke that feeling and I you know you know it's like it's every sentence every paragraph every every you know scene you're trying to feel on the rewrites and the edits is this doing what it needs to do and sometimes it is down to just the line you know have you dropped that there have you dropped this here is that is that just the right touch you know the best writers I think are so subtle in the way they create um, feeling and emotion in us, and I'm always trying to get there. What does the title "The Murder Rule" allude to? 
Oh man, this is such a weird little bit of law. <laughs> um, it refers to the felony murder rule, which is this odd little bit of law that says if you commit a felony and there's a death during the course of the felony, then you can be found guilty of murder. So it's interpreted differently depending on which state you're in. And some states have quite a few safeguards in place to you know, make sure that it isn't imposed unfairly, but a lot of states don't. And it has resulted in some really odd convictions. So there was one, for example, where a man committed an armed robbery and he was caught, arrested, handcuffed and put in the back of a police car. And he was still sitting in the back of the police car, handcuffed when the police officer shot his accomplice dead. And he was convicted of felony murder, the guy in the back of the police car. Um, there was another odder situation where a guy, uh, let me see if I get these facts right, but there was a guy, I believe he was at a party, a young man, and he was approached by a friend and the friend asked if, or a friend of a friend asked if he could borrow his car. And he did say, depending whether you believe the defense or the prosecution, the prosecution said that the guy who wanted to borrow the car said he was going to break into a woman's house. He said something like, you know, this girl has my stuff. I want to get my stuff back. And if she's not there, I'm just going to break in and get it. But I need your car. Can I borrow your car? So the guy let him borrow his car or the guy lending the car went home to bed, fell asleep and was ultimately arrested and convicted of felony murder because the person who borrowed his car went to the woman's house, broke in. She was there with a friend. There was a fight and somebody died. And because he was deemed to be an accomplice to the original break in, he was found guilty of felony murder. And like as a former lawyer, that's just crazy to me because we were always taught to be criminally responsible for something. You have to have actually carried out the act and intended to carry out the act. And here we have neither of those things. So it seemed to fit the book for a number of reasons. Firstly, there's a case that references it, but also I was really interested in this idea of responsibility. You know, where where does our responsibility begin and end? Like we're responsible for the direct outcome of our acts. Are we also responsible for anything that could possibly be foreseen by us? What about the stuff that's a bit more difficult to foresee? Like how, how to what degree do we need to be responsible? And so that was why it seemed to be a fit. So there's uh, there's a lot of double entendre uh, in the book. You know, the, the, the title even, you know, the murder rule, you're, you're sp speaking about a specific portion of, of, of case law. Mm -hmm. Um, but then it, it, you know, it also kind of, um, uh, you know, in, even in some of the marketing materials for the book, you know, I've seen first rule, make them like you second rule, you know, make them yes. need you third rule, make them pay. Um, yeah. so that you, there, there are several things in the book that kind of refer to, it, it could be one way or another. Um, yeah. Are those fun things that you like to put in just to kind of mess with people's heads? Oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> well, the journey to that title was such a long one, Hank. When I finally got there, I was so happy because it's like, oh man, it works on all the levels, you know, um, because I like that idea that play with Hannah, you know, the rules, because that's who she is. She's like, I'm going to come in, I'm going to make them like me, I'm going to make them need me, and then I'm going to take it down. And I just love that for her. As a uh, an, an Irish citizen living in Australia, writing a book about law in the United States, um, <laughs> that's enough to make um, some people just never want to touch this kind of book. How do you go about, um, you know, getting all of the intricate, you know, elements of of law and and the way that each country governs themselves, and then, you know, even in America, how each of the 50 states that make up mm -hmm. the country, you know, have have little, you know, different um, uh, laws and the way that that certain things work out that that had to be a headache. Oh, my God, such a headache. And <laughs> it is many years since I read original, you know, primary um, sources for legislation. I mean, I haven't had to read tax law or criminal law for a long, long time. And it, it is, you know, it is complex. Look, Hank, I'm a big believer in cheating um, where I can. So <laughs> I found some specific case law that fit what I was trying to do. And I followed the progress of those cases through the courts and, and over the years, rather than trying to go back to, you know, here's the federal law, here's the state law. These are the, you know, these are the changes that took place over what this year versus that year. And this is what would have been in place if you if you try to do that. I mean, I'd still be researching for that book. Um, and some of it I had to do to some degree, but the best way I found was if I could find specific cases where, you know, the, the facts of the case were similar, not the same, but similar to what I was doing. 
I could then track those through and read the case reports um, and then just read the, the law that was referenced in those case reports and be confident that I was using the right law at the right time. So that was how I went about it. So we, we talked earlier about um, how, uh, you know, you, you hoped that people would like Hannah for for some reason, um, but you uh, on purpose made her kind of unlikable, at least on, on the surface. Um, mm -hmm. When you get to the end of the book, um, do you hope that people's expectations are completely spun around and um, do you derive great pleasure from pulling the rug out from under people? <laughs> yes, but I don't know. Hannah's a funny one. I mean, I totally get why not everybody likes her in the beginning because she is utterly ruthless. And the other thing about her that kind of throws you is she's so convinced she's right. I mean, she is just so convinced that she's right. And there are reasons for that, but I, you know, that's a bit off putting and it's, that's her journey really is to kind of have that wake up call and understand that she doesn't know everything and that she's a lot to learn and, and, and it's a hard path for her. But at the same time, Hannah is a little bit a degree of wish fulfillment for me because when I was a young lawyer, I was so careful and most young women had to be really careful in those days. You know, we were, I was 22 when I qualified, I was going to meetings where it was all guys and they were all, you know, 20, 30 years older than me. And there was just a cultural expectation that women behaved a certain way. And it was funny because I was talking to two US lawyers um, the other day on a podcast and they're still practicing and both of them said it has changed, but not that much. Their experience was very similar. Um, so I, I would never have behaved the way Hannah does. And I love the fact that she has this deep belief in her own abilities without being arrogant. She just knows what she's good at. And then if you combine that confidence with her absolute conviction that she's right, she's just going to go and do stuff. You know, um, it isn't always the right thing, but she does it. And I, I do admire that. So I, I do like her. I know she's not for everybody in the beginning, although I think I think most people come around by the end of the book and I hope they do. Absolutely. The murder rule is available everywhere now when you're hearing this. You can grab it in Kindle edition or hardcover or like me, uh, get the audio book. This is so much fun to listen to um, in, in audio format. Um, Dervla, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into, you know, your amazing back catalog and all the fun stuff that you're doing, where can they connect with you online? Oh, you can find me on social media, on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. And it's all Dervla McTiernan, which is D-E-R-V-L-A. McTiernan is M-C-T-I-E-R-N-A-N. And I have a website under the same name. Excellent. Uh, the Murder Rule, pick it up today. You will not be disappointed. I give my own personal uh, guarantee seal on this one. Uh, Dervla, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. My absolute pleasure, Hank. Thank you so much for having me.